So let's turn to Titus then, chapter 2, reading from verse 11 into Titus 3, as far as verse 8. So Titus 2, 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves are also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various strong emotions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So we're in Titus then. Uh, Titus chapter 2 from verse 11 into Titus 3 and verse 8. And twice in this passage, you get Paul urging Titus to teach these things, to exhort these things, to emphasise what we find in this passage. So, sure, we all agree that if Paul is encouraging Titus then to do that, then we also ought to look at this passage. So this section seems to contain material that Paul thinks is very important for church life and for individual Christians. So, two encouragements to pay attention to this passage. What I want to do is look with you specifically at verses 11, 12 and 13 of Titus 2. But what we'll do today is we'll put these verses into a context and then we'll set things up for our future studies. So let's revisit these three verses, Titus 2, 11, 12 and 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So our theme is going to be grace, you see grace there in verse 11. Grace is described here by Paul as our teacher. So in verse 12, we see there that grace teaches us that. And I want us to think about grace as our teacher. And uh, we'll see this evening that grace is linked to the word appearing. And this word, it sounds very ordinary in our English language, is one of the great New Testament words. And we have the word appearing uh, at least three times in this section. So if you take a look, first of all, we have it in verse 11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So there's a past reference there to the idea of appearing. Go down to verse 13. 
you have a future reference to appearing there. Can you see it? Titus 2 verse 8, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So there's the second reference, and this now takes us into the future. And then you have another reference to appearing in chapter 3 in verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of our God and Saviour toward man appeared, and there, it's not really past or present, it's a fact. It's a, a one-off statement, if you like. It's something that is true and remains true and continues to be true. So grace is linked to the idea of appearing, and grace is our teacher. So let's think of it like this then. I want to talk first of all about this relationship to grace and appearing. Then I, I'm going to ask the question, why do we need grace as a teacher? It's a very unusual construction, this, okay? So why is it so important in the context of church life? And then I want to outline what it is that grace teaches us. And uh, in true sermonic form, and I'm glad of it, grace teaches us three things, or there are three areas uh, in which grace functions as a teacher. Okay, so grace linked to appearing, why we need grace as a teacher, and the three areas that grace seeks to teach the Christian. And some of you may remember that a good while ago now, uh, we took a, a look at this passage. And uh, when we were going through the pastoral epistles uh, in our general study, I thought it would be useful uh, to revisit uh, this section. So let's link the idea of grace to appearing. So I've shown you the three occasions where the word occurs. And it's a word in the original Greek that we are familiar with. And uh, the Greek word is epiphanel, and we get the word epiphany uh, from it. And an epiphany is a sudden appearance of light. It's uh, a sudden circling of light that may lead to a moment of insight, it may lead to a, a moment of discovery, uh, an unveiling of a secret. What we have here is the word epiphany being applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is described as an epiphany, a sudden unveiling, a sudden revelation. Uh, of the person of Jesus Christ. So epiphany, appearance, works in this way. If you take a look at the first occasion when we have the word, Titus 2 and verse 11, we have there a reference to the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. His birth in Bethlehem, coming in human form, being found in appearance as a man, here is God taking human nature to himself and being born of the Virgin Mary, born under the law, uh, born in our world. That, uh, that whole first um, appearance, the first coming of Christ, is described as an epiphany. And what we are told in verse 11 of Titus 2 is that that coming of Christ is the appearance, the revelation of grace. It is the grace of God in human form. Now again, all I want to do at this point is remind you of what we've studied before, and I don't think it's that long ago that we had a series on the grace of God, and we saw then, do you remember, that grace is a person. Grace is not some kind of um, floaty cloud that hovers above the head of a Christian. It's not some vague kind of mist uh, through which God reaches out to us. It's a solid, physical human being. The grace of God is grace made flesh 
in the person of Jesus Christ. And we can say that not only is Jesus Christ grace made flesh, hope made flesh is also true uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our hope, flesh and blood. And also, of course, Jesus Christ is the love of God with flesh and blood made physical, tangible, visible, real, if you like. So what Paul is doing here, he's laying out for us that when we think of the grace of God, we think of the actual person of Jesus Christ. We think of him as a baby. We think of him as an infant. We think of him as an adolescent, as an adult. The grace of God made man. And that is an appearance. It's a, a revelation of light. It is a manifestation uh, of uh, God's purposes. Grace is Jesus Christ. And uh, what we then have is the idea that grace, who is Jesus Christ, becomes our teacher. So let's ask the second of our questions then. Why do we need Jesus Christ to teach us grace? And it seems to me that the, the reason is grace is something that is completely foreign to us as human beings. We are familiar with the idea of works. We understand the idea of earning something, of deserving something, of working for something. We are familiar with the idea that if we do something, then other people respond to us. So all those ideas are familiar in terms of our human experience. And it's even familiar in the realm of religion. So the idea that you offer God something, you do a work for God, you visit a temple, you offer a sacrifice, you, you give a, a money, you make a promise, you give a vow, all of these things are very, very familiar to us. And uh, it's part of how we work, uh, perhaps as human beings in relation to each other. But it's certainly the, the idea that's natural to us about how a, a relationship with a God is meant to work. So we do something, we do something good, we do something to make a God happy. We do something to please a God. And that God then responds. We say a prayer and he answers. We make an offering and he blesses. Now that's very familiar. Right across human experience, it's the foundation for all religions. But when it comes to Christianity, it is the exact opposite. Everything is a matter of grace. And because we, we are not familiar with this idea, we have to be taught it. And we have to be taught it again and again and again, because the old ideas of works are so deeply rooted in our minds, our hearts, our actions, our outlook. Grace has to teach us what grace is. So let's try a definition then. And I'm sure you've all got much better definitions of grace uh, that, that, that I have. And you may well have heard definitions of grace over the years. I'm not going to rehash any of the old definitions that we might be familiar with. Instead, I want to take the idea that grace is something which is completely undeserved. That's the idea of grace. So in our experience with God, we have to be taught by Jesus again and again and again and again that God does not deal with us according to what we deserve. And we need that lesson as a lifelong experience, because we are very good at falling into the trap that at some point God will treat us as we deserve. So, for example, we're very good at understanding 
that God initially saved us by grace. We, we didn't deserve that. So we can accept quite easily that God brought us to faith in Jesus in the beginning, and that was by grace. We didn't deserve it. We were sinners. The problem is, and you've seen this before, that as we go on in our Christian experience, we, we lose sight of the fact that everything that God gives us is undeserved. We cannot make anything a matter of merit. So however we are as Christians, whatever we do as Christians, we need to be continuously taught by Jesus that merit never comes into the picture. There is no place at all for God to respond to us based on what we do. Now, if we only take a minute to think about that, I'm sure that if, like me, you have taken a minute to think that through, you'll see very easily that you often fall into the trap of thinking that God treats us as we deserve. How do we do it? Well, I think we do it in a negative way. So we would never for a moment think that we've done something positive and so God will bless us. So I'm sure you, we, we've never thought like this, have we? Right, I've said my praise, I've read my Bible, and when I used to be able to, I've gone to church, therefore God will bless me. We don't think like that. We think negatively. We think that if we've done something wrong, if we've made a mistake, if we've failed, if we've sinned, then into our minds comes the ideas that God is now going to deal with us as we deserve. And so Jesus has to teach us constantly that when we fail, grace is still the way in which God will deal with us. When we've made our mistakes and when we've tripped up for the 10,000th time, grace is still the principle by which God deals with us. That's what we need to learn. And that's where Jesus, our teacher, will teach us the meaning of grace. We need to learn what grace is when we have fallen into the dirt, when we've bruised our knees, when our hands have been scraped because of a fall on the floor, our pride has been wounded, we've got mud on our face, and we are burning with shame. That's when we need to learn that it's all of grace. And so grace teaches us in those moments because that's the moment when we fall back on works so grace is very strange grace is absolutely wonderful grace is equally terrifying grace can be open to abuse grace can be misunderstood grace is alien to our natures as creatures Grace is alien to our nature as sinners. And grace even remains a strange thing to us as Christians. And so we need to be constantly taught exactly what is the meaning of grace. So that's why, according to the Apostle Paul, we have grace as our teacher. So grace first appeared then in the coming of Christ. We have a second epiphany. You can see it in chapter 2 of Titus and verse 13. We have a future coming, a future appearance of Jesus Christ. So there's a first coming when grace first appeared. There is then a, a second epiphany. 
uh, a future one when Jesus Christ will suddenly appear. And what Paul does is he makes a distinction. That second appearing, the second epiphany, chapter 2, verse 13, is going to bring in hope and glory. So just as the first epiphany brings in grace in the person of Jesus Christ, this second one, this future one, will bring in hope and bring in glory. And then, as we saw, there's a third occurrence of the word. It's in Titus 3 and verse 4. And, and this is taking um, the, 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 the appearance of Christ his first appearance as a given fact. It's a, an ongoing truth. It's a truth for all the ages, that the love and kindness of God, our Saviour, toward man has appeared. And what's interesting here is the idea that grace in the person of Jesus Christ is towards men. Grace is not offered to creation, it's not offered to the angels, grace is offered to men. And the word there emphasizes the weakness, the humanity of us all. So both in chapter 2 verse 11 and chapter 3 and verse 4, it is the idea of the grace of God in action in the person of Jesus Christ for the good of for the benefit of, for the sake of, frail, vulnerable human beings. That's why the grace of God has made an appearance. Okay then, so let's ask the question, what is it that grace teaches us? And uh, I want us to see uh, in verse 12 of chapter 2, and then uh, into verse 13, that there are three ways in which grace teaches us. If you want to, think of it as three areas in which Jesus works to teach us the meaning of grace. The first of them is a negative. So you see it in Titus 2 and verse 12, teaching us that, and here's the first negative, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. You know, don't you, I've said to you many, many times, I hate the word lusts. It's a, it's a ridiculously embarrassing English word. And it's a reflection of the Greek for powerful emotions. Any kind, not just sexual, but any kind of powerful emotion. And what I think is really interesting here is this. Grace has to teach us how to say no to ourselves, how to say no to our emotional life, how to say no to the things that we might want, that we may want very powerfully, very deeply, very passionately, that grace has to teach us how to say no to the things that we may want to do. Uh, and those things may be perfectly okay things, but we need to learn that in our own experience, it may be very important for us to learn to say no to ourselves. So this isn't about saying no to other people. This is about saying no to ourselves. And uh, we don't do that by force of will. We don't say no to ourselves by strength of character. We don't say no to ourselves by means of self-discipline. It's only the grace of God that can ever teach anyone to say no to herself or to himself. And the, the reason why we would want to say no to ourselves is because it's for our good. Now, if we stop there just for a second, okay? Think about the world in which we live. Think about those things that we often talk about in our societies. Think about the big issues of our day. And we've got issues, haven't we, to do with sexuality, to do with gender. And one of the things we observe in our society is you can never say no anymore. No is almost the ultimate hate word. We have no right, we think, 
to say no to one another. And we certainly have no right to say no to ourselves. And if you're out and about at all uh, these days, and if you go to a supermarket, as I did last week, and had somebody shout at me because they thought that I was uh, invading their personal space, we live, don't we, amongst people who are not used to being told, no, what you want is what you get, and it's what you have, and it's what you deserve, and everybody's got to give it to you, and they can never, ever be a challenge. Now, Jesus teaches us, and it's a lesson of grace, that there are circumstances in which, and there are times when, and there are things about ourselves that we must say no to. And those things, as you look at the word again uh, in uh, verse 12, those things might be, there might be a no I need to learn in my relationship with God. Did you notice that? Look at Titus 2 and verse 12, teaching us that, denying ungodliness. So sometimes for the Christian, we need to bring the word no into our relationship with God. What I might want from God, or what I might want to do that God may not want me to do. So grace has to teach us this, because otherwise we don't stand a chance, and we would never learn this lesson. It can only be by being dealt with in a way that we don't deserve that we'll ever learn this. So there may be a no for you, there may be a no for me, that I need to work out in terms of my relationship with God. And then the second one, you can see it in verse 12 again, worldly lusts, is there may be times when because I'm a Christian, I must learn by the grace of God to say no to what I, I want, to what I feel very strongly about. When my, my emotions are hot and, and my passions are raised and, and my temper is up and, and I feel something very deeply, I may need to learn to say no. And only grace can teach me that. And it's only grace that can show me when I might need to say that no. So that's the first area. Let's move on, shall we? The second area that grace is going to teach us is, a, is more positive, if, if you can use the word positive. And it's again in verse 12. Grace is going to teach me how to live. How to live day by day. How to live, in the words at the end of the verse, in this present age. Now, those of you with good memories will remember Galatians 2. And Paul describes the now life that we live. It's a life of weakness. Do you remember? Galatians 2 verse 20, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this now life, grace is going to teach me how to live as a Christian. So you can't teach me how to live. A no preacher can teach you how to live. And there's no set of rules that's going to teach you how to live. There's no universal set of rights and wrongs that we all have to sign up to. It is grace that is going to teach us how to live in the here and now. And when you break that down, grace is going to teach us how to live in three ways. Can you see the words there? How to live here and now soberly, how to live righteously, and how to live godly. Now that's where I want to concentrate our studies. I want to take each of those words in turn. What does it mean for grace to teach me how to live soberly, righteously, and godly? Okay, let's take those up and let's explore them together. That's the second area in which the grace of God is going to be our teacher. And then thirdly, lastly, you see it there, I'm sure in verse 13, grace is going to teach me how to look forward. Now all of us are looking forward, aren't we? 
I'm certainly not looking forward to going to reopen shops. I couldn't think of anything worse. But maybe you guys are really excited about going to Debenhams or Marks and Spencers, but just you can't do it yet. You know, it's five more than five miles away. So what are you looking forward to? Okay, you're looking forward to having your family to stay over. You're looking forward to going and staying over with them. You're looking forward to a holiday with your family. You know, okay. So, so we, there's something about us that, that causes us always to look forward. Well, grace is going to teach us to look forward. And to look forward in the present age. To look forward now. To start to look forward today and what grace is going to teach us to do is look forward to that second appearing of jesus christ you can see it can't you in verse 13 so the grace of god teaching us to look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great god and savior jesus christ now that verse is just packed full of things to look forward to you know we do we've done it every week haven't we since the lockdown we've had one little thing another little thing to look forward to here grace is teaching us to look forward to the ultimate things to look forward to the great epiphany when our great god and that's a really unusual phrase coupled in chapter 3 verse 4 jesus is described here as our great god you know, that's, what, that's, that's an amazing statement to look forward to our great God and our Savior, the same person, the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to look forward to the glory of his appearance, to look forward to that moment when our hope will be realized, our hope will become uh, visible, tangible, real. Grace is going to teach us to look forward to that. Because it's only by grace that we will ever see that or reach that. So that's what grace is going to do. It's going to give us a future to, to lay hold of and to lay hold of that future in the present age. Okay, so those are the three areas. How to say no, how to live, and how to look forward. That's what Jesus will teach us in his grace so just to if you like give us a, another idea of where we're going i want to take the, the first of those three terms that you found in uh, verse 12 grace is going to teach us how to live soberly now this word is one of paul's favorites he loves this word and i'm going to show you how often he uses the word and he seems to concentrate the use of this word in the pastoral epistles, especially. So I want to turn to 2 Timothy. And how many of you will be surprised if when we say turn to 2 Timothy, you will already know the verse I have in mind. 2 Timothy and it's chapter 1 and it's verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, there's the word, okay? What you have in Titus 2 as soberly is sound mind in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. The root word is the same, soundness of thinking rightness of thought okay soundness it's in 2 timothy 1 7 but in chapter 2 of titus before we see it here in verse 12 that same word in its root with its sort of variations has occurred at least four times okay and i want to show you where they are so by now we should be in titus chapter 2 and we first see the same root word in verse 2. So turn to Titus 2, verse 2, that the older men be, and there it is, sober, soundness of mind. Okay? So in the church, 
the elders, those who are experienced Christian men, are to be taught by grace how to be sober, sound of mind. That's where it first comes in the chapter. Then when you go to verse 4, it's there again. And it's almost completely lost in the English translations. Uh, and that's really sad because the same root with all its variations is found in Titus 2 and verse 4. And uh, what we have here is a description of the experienced women in the church. And the experienced women are also to be of sound mind. And in their soundness of mind, they are to be helpful to the younger women. And they're going to help the younger women with two wonderfully compound words in the Greek. See if I can just look at it, Titus 2 and verse 4. So it says in Titus 2 verse 4, and this is my rough, rough Greek, that they be sound-minded to the young women, making them lovers of their homes and lovers of their children. So the young women, home lovers, husband lovers, children lovers. But it's the older experienced women who from the, the soundness of their minds will it help the younger men, women so to be. So soundness of mind applies to older men, and older women and then go down the verses and you come to verse five now again how woeful are the translations here in my english translation verse five of chapter two of titus reads like this that the young women are to be discreet chaste homemakers good obedient well what a list but the first word there, for some reason translated in my version as, as discreet, is guess what? It's the word for sound-mindedness. So old men, old women, young women, they are to be sound of mind. And then lastly, as you come down to verse 6, there it is again, okay? Titus 2 and verse 6. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. So here is the, the root word uh, from which we can get wisdom. Uh, it's to do with thinking, understanding, rightness of mind. So what grace has to teach all of us whether we are married or not married, old or young, male or female, whatever our responsibilities in life are, whatever our relationships in life might be, grace is to teach us how to think correctly. How to think correctly, rightly, so that we don't get afraid, so that we don't experience anxiety, grace has to teach us how to think clearly and helpfully in whatever situation we find ourselves. Now that is where I want us to go next Sunday. What does this word mean? What does it mean for all of us? And how is grace going to teach us to think now, you're all going to say to me, aren't you? Look, Neil, we know. We know what an emphasis there is in the New Testament on our minds. So what we've got here then is grace meeting us in our minds. It is Jesus Christ teaching us what grace does to the way we think, to the way that we understand ourselves, to the way that we understand our lives, our responsibilities, our duties, our calling, our place. It is a wonderful um, teaching 
on how undeserved favour, mercy, love fills the mind of the Christian and shapes the way that we are to think. And so, with that in mind then, let's end. Side of the pastoral epistles this time, there's one other occasion when the Apostle Paul will use this word and all its derivatives. I wonder if you can guess where. And whenever I say to you, can you guess where Paul might have said something like this, this text that we're now looking at? Where has he said something similar? What do you think? Which epistle? All of you immediately know which one, don't you? Because it's Romans. So let's turn to Romans then, and uh, we'll see another use of this word, okay? And uh, if I was to press my luck here, and say, where in Romans does Paul talk about the mind and the importance of the mind and the place of the mind and, and thinking generally? I'm sure you'd all get it, wouldn't you? You all know. Where is it? Well, it's Romans 12. So let's turn to Romans 12. And uh, we'll finish here then. Romans 12. And uh, it's not verses 1 and 2 this time which is about being transformed by the renewing of your mind, okay? But that's the context. The context is metamorphosis, the, the, the trans, translation of our minds, the transformation of our mind. And this word then uh, occurs in verse 3. So Romans 12 and verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think, and there it goes, soberly, as God has given to each one a measure of faith. So there it is. God, in his grace, is going to teach us how to think soberly. And in that verse, right thinking is halfway between two extremes. So in your thinking, there are two dangers to the way that you might think about yourself. You might overestimate yourself. So you might have too high an opinion of yourself. And I feel like saying hands up if you've got too high an opinion of yourself. I can't see, even though my glasses are off, anybody raising their hand, eh? The other extreme is you may have too low an opinion of yourself, that you may think of yourself unhelpfully, that you may be critical of yourself, that you may have a hard and negative view of yourself. And so what grace has to do is teach you how to think about yourself in the middle ground and that middle ground is described by Paul in a very wonderful way in verse 3 of Romans 12 do you notice it look at the verse again for I say through the grace given to me that everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly and here's the definition of what it means to think of yourself in the right way as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. We need to learn to think of ourselves, and I'm giving my game away for next Sunday night, really. We need to learn to see ourselves as God sees us. The measure of our faith is the rule of faith. How does God regard us? Well, grace is to teach us that we are, are to learn to see ourselves as he does. Our view of ourselves is to be a reflection of his view of us. Well, that's our direction of travel then. So hopefully now we've got a clear idea of where we're going. Grace is our teacher. Uh, it's the person of Jesus Christ is our teacher, learning to say no, we won't say any more about that, learning to live in the here and now, that's where we'll emphasise um, our studies, and then we may, we'll see how we go, we may then say a little bit 
about how grace will teach us in the here and now to look forward uh, to the, the second appearing of Jesus Christ. Okay, William, 